Hi all, I am absolutely delighted to have a stunning game from Lila to show you today. Lila against Commodo. So this is Commodo, the MCTS version. So that's Monte Carlo Tree Search component. Okay, so this is a time limit of 90 minutes with a five second increment. The opening book, so Lila playing white, C4, this is in the opening book. Uh, so it starts off pretty solid. So bishop g4 here, knight bd2, knight bd7, end of book here. We have queen c2, e6. So the bishop is clearly outside of the pawn chain. That's good news in a way, it's not a blocked in bishop. But interestingly, uh, this bishop, if it ends up on g6, it might mean double pawns, which might mean a lever for white. So is this going to be tapped into this property of this bishop if it ever has to go back to g6? We have b3, a waiting move, not casting. Bishop d6, white castles here, bishop h5, bishop b2, which reinforces the grip on the dark squares, especially e5, queen c7. And now a tension release move you might be surprised with, c5. It's putting uh, some grip on dark squares though. Bishop e7, and now I find this quite amusing actually and deep this next move. I wonder if you can guess it. It's a kind of positional move. 500 points if you can guess it. White play here. Okay, you might consider it an anti-positional move. It doesn't let weaken the light squares. I think the fun thing about this is that it kind of anticipates the bishop going to g6, having double pawns, and then king g2 and using the g6 pawn as a lever with rook h1, h4, h5. It's very, very deep-sighted. Uh, vision here which I guess if the game wasn't like that I wouldn't say it now so maybe it's the benefit of hindsight as well that I'm, I'm saying this now but g3 if you look at it on its own merits superficially it weakens light squares uh, a5 a3 black castled b4 and now bishop g6 Quite often, I believe Levin Oronian, for example, is one of many super GMs using this system. But usually this bishop uh, is around here exchanging off for this bishop, trying to exchange off. And then black's usually playing a move like b5 after. So just getting rid of the bishop. But here there's a slight downside penalty if black has doubled pawns. Uh, which is the case now after bishop takes g6 hg and I did try and investigate here was this bishop g6 actually forced uh, is that the case well let's say this knight e5 rook bd8 h3 it seems as though the bishop could be nudged in any case and then stuff like this could happen where you know king g2 and rook h1 might be follow-ups for you know later f4 h5 with a dangerous attack and in, an intensification of, of light square pressure. If we look at this again, uh, if knight takes e5, I noticed here uh, white could actually play this, and then bishop d4 is a strong move, not f4, much stronger than f4. So for example, knight takes e5, f4 now, putting the bishop back. This gets a very promising position for white with a clear advantage, uh, this kind of scenario. Uh, if we look at that again with instead of knight takes uh, e5 uh, well sorry in, in, instead of trying to trap the bishop with g6 this doesn't really work out that well with h3 so for example king takes g4 and then white again ends up with a really good position in uh, it seems all variations just white ends up with a very good uh, position uh, so yeah I've been checking this out if here by the way rook takes h3 instead you might ask then f4 and then if the black rooks double white ends up uh, being okay in this scenario with a small edge so it seems as though uh, yeah bishop g6 becomes necessary uh, so Leela took and we have bishop c3 now so some dark square grip on the queen side some resolving of tension there, rook fb8, and now king g2, so this key move, so white intends uh, to make use of h4, h5 it seems, knight c8, rook ab1, queen c8, h4, we have knight c7, rook h1, knight b5, rook be1, not minding the knight exchange, 
on c3 knight a3 was played if we look at knight takes c3 what what, are, what is the implication here it seems as though white ends up with an advantage anyway for example like this white could end up with a nice position uh, good prospects there for white uh, it seems yeah this clamp on the possession on the dark squares that pawn might be vulnerable later might be ganged up on with you know maybe queen a3 might be too late so there's there's prospects for white there so uh, knight a3 not committing to that exchange of minor pieces queen c1 knight b5 and now uh this is really interesting e4 uh for very interesting reasons and i try to conceptualize this what's going on here with e4 if black's not taking uh but let me get the pawn to e5 first so this happened a bit of bit of playing around there and again bishop c1 so not committing this pawn any further for the moment b6 and here it is e5 so in one respect of course e5 looks as though it's just got the intention of putting pressure on g6 to make h5 uh, you know under greater pressure for g6 sure that's one aspect but another aspect if you look at white's pawns uh, at the moment all of them without exception at this moment are on dark squares and they're sort of poking in to dark squares and the fun thing about this this poking into dark squares is some of them might actually be uh, tactically sensitive later if pieces are also on dark squares these pawns provide outpost squares basically even you know tactical outpost squares one wouldn't generally consider um you know f6 an outpost square because it's surely, surely it's covered with with uh, the g7 pawn but nevertheless these are kind of outpost centric pawns uh, for d6 and f6 and b6 and a5 if the knight ever moves to a5 it's supported so we've got these outposts on dark squares to think about tactically it's like when we do a battery in chess when we double rooks we're, we're kind of providing support for infiltration so in a way these are providing support for infiltration tactics so just bear that in mind knight a6 bishop a3 knight c7 and a bit of playing around here on the queen side now knight g5 and we get basically uh, a lot of pressure now being uh, uh, emerging black for the moment doesn't play bishop takes g5 uh, and plays b takes you might think well hold on what about this pawn here it turns out this might be too slow for black's king safety after knight f3 this position after h5 it looks as though there's a convergence a common square of attack as well the queen's got a nice view on h7 so for example like this it's uh, dangerous for black this position gets super dangerous uh, for example like this with knight f7 threatening uh, checkmate with rook h8 and if we get this position uh, white's just winning material black's having to distract there otherwise there's big trouble in other variations uh, you know otherwise yeah there's, there's, there's just huge trouble here okay so um, if we look at an alternative uh, uh, let's see instead of b takes c if we looked at b t bishop takes g5 hg this position with the queen going to f3 uh, is dangerous so even if d f the d4 pawn is sacked this uh, battery on the h file going in on the h file uh, would win the queen if nothing else and that's a big advantage for white there so it is very dangerous and in that line uh, instead of um, if white had played rook h4 again um, this is uh, also dangerous rook h4 is playable as well the the f and h files here are pretty dangerous and look the outpost score on a5 can be celebrated uh, but yeah this is this is too much for black this kind of stuff but anyway b takes for the moment was played b takes rook bb4 like df3 bishop takes g5 hg so again we have all the pawns of white on dark squares and these kind of outpost squares supported okay not a5 anymore but these these are the supportive uh, outpost squares to think about from a tactical perspective as well pretty interesting that white's pawns uh, are like this uh, so like drafts or something so queen a8 and we see the queen coming to e3 on dark square and there's dark square support of course as we mentioned queen a6 queen f4 so what's the concrete problem with black's position well 
the age fall is one clear thing uh, looking at doubling rooks etc and things like um, also knight h4 to g6 so the king ever wanted to step to f8 so there's a lot of dangers it seems the king wanted to make a run for it here and played king f8 uh, we have rook h8 check king e7 and now with all this talk of dark square tactical outposts i've given you a little bit of a clue for the absolutely stunning move that was played in this position uh, i'll give you 10 seconds please try and pause the video try and work out this move for yourself it's a move of supreme beauty to behold and i've played such a move once against fm chromos which i i mentioned in a core post what does it feel like to play a brilliant move elated as if you're creating a, a work of art so what's the move here that white played if i give you yeah take 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 a few seconds pause the video try and work it out white to play okay behold queen f6 a move of great beauty so yes the outpost pawns supporting pawns on d6 and f6 particularly f6 stunning use of f6 here black took with the knight on g takes f6 g takes this position after e takes white gets a nice knight e5 so for example king d7 knight e5 is actually checkmate excitement should be built up in our minds when we're controlling a uh, escape squares of the king because it means that the killer check in, in which we call checkmate is emerging on king takes f6 this is still in the variation mode bishop g5 check bishop g7 here rook e h1 would be mating uh, black would be defenseless in this position all of these pieces irrelevant uh, if f5 then we just play this rook 1 to h7 checkmate so basically uh yeah after g takes black is getting in huge trouble being mated in two key variations here after g takes uh, so that's beautiful stuff so black actually played knight takes now we have e takes f6 g takes g takes f6 so again here if king d7 there's knight e5 uh chat mate which is beautiful to behold uh so the king has to play king takes f6 we have bishop g5 check king g7 and now rook h e1 sorry rook e h1 threatening uh this checkmate now black played uh a delaying tactic uh a huge delaying tactic we know from Brexit here about delaying tactics. Okay, yeah. So, so a delaying tactic, Queen F1, actually, technical issue, Queen F1. So here, uh, in fact, the rook doesn't uh, have to worry about the other rook here. Rook takes F1 was played because black can't afford in this position. King takes H8. Black played Rook A8. You might think, well, why not? Uh, if we look at this, if King takes then check here and the bishop and one rook is enough so king g8 rook h1 and how does black actually prevent rook h8 checkmate yes that's going to be checkmate yeah so it's it's actually not even a distraction of the rook uh, but if the king took then there's things like rook a1 check and then taking on h1 so it's better to take with the rook and that's a piece up thanks very much black played on with rook a8 and so white's just a piece up it's for one pawn only so that's pretty big advantage uh, the bishop drops back here okay g4 again trying to fix outposts on dark squares again that's funny in a way so that's uh, that g5 is desperate doesn't want uh, stuff to happen maybe you know after g5 there'd be knight h2 to g4 to f6 later and that'll be dangerous again for the for the black king so g5 giving up a pawn so it's just a pure piece up here now it's uh, all over really by the shouting uh so this is all pretty much over that's just getting torn to pieces and we're waiting for both sides to think it's plus 10 before it's 
uh, a virtual resign here black kind of virtually resigns plus 10 for 10 ply now if the game continued here rook a8 would be a good move because that is threatening rook h8 checkmate here and if black um, so d3 that is checkmate if black wants to delay things then knight g5 for example check and these two pawns past pawns are just winning here for white that's overloading black anyway so if you wanted to see the long route to the chat mate here it is okay i'll take you to the game ending so king uh h6 the game ended so i found this game quite instructive uh from the sort of funny point of g3 uh it's like uh bit funny knowing that uh, there'll be double pawns to pick on later and that the king's going to be useful for king g2 and h pawn coming up i just thought that was a bit funny g3 funny looking but it makes perfect sense in retrospect uh the other thing is yeah having the pawn on e5 uh the tactical benefits of the out virtual outpost squares even though we wouldn't think of f6 as an outpost because of g7 it kind of was tactically so I thought that was great stuff as well. And, and generally whites, uh, you know, digging into the dark squares generally throughout the game with pawns on dark squares. I thought that was quite fascinating. So a fascinating, instructive, entertaining game all round, I believe. If you enjoyed it as much as me and you want to play me or other YouTubers, check out that link, that bit.ly link to capital Y, small v, small a, five, capital M, capital B, like five megabytes at the end. You can challenge me or other YouTubers. I'll invite you for a game. Just register with that link. Okay. Thanks very much.